Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. It's my pleasure to be on. We are continuing our series on hadith, and now we're going to look at what academic scholarship, and in particular orientalists, have said about hadith and, and how to respond to those uh, criticisms. So, Dr. Shabir, what have been the major criticisms of orientalists? I understand that they are the loudest um, against, the, they are the loudest individuals who seem to be against hadith. Yes, um, uh, if you don't mind, I think a little bit of background before the Orientalists come on the scene may, may be okay. essential here. Uh, so uh, the, the hadiths were collected in the major books in, in about the third century of the Muslim era. And subsequent to that, uh, the Muslim scholarship uh, tended to accept these major books as being authentic. They classified them as the, the authentic books. Uh, the Seha Sitta became a common term among Muslims referring to six books as being authentic. And uh, over the centuries, uh, later scholars wrote commentaries on this on these books. So we have uh, the commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. We have the commentary on Sahih Muslim, one of the other collection of hadith, uh, one of the other hadith books by Al-Imam al-Nawawi. Uh, we have scholars uh, who th thought theoretically about hadith, such as Ibn Salah, and they wrote books and volumes about these, defending the hadith and, and giving uh, Muslims the assurance that we know these hadiths, uh, we, we understand them all, these are authentic hadiths, this is what we follow. Mm -hmm. So along came the Orientalists. <laughs> so well, with the, the European Renaissance, uh, scholars started to look um, uh, first at Judaism and Christianity. They studied the Bible in detail and uh, they used all of the uh, modern critical historical uh, apparatuses that they could muster uh, and, and they brought these to bear on, on the old the New Testaments and uh, on the history of Christian dogma, and they try to deconstruct and unravel. Uh, of course, they, not with bad intention. Many of them were Jews and Christians themselves, uh, but they were trying to get to the bottom of things from a historical point of view, seeing everything with a critical eye rather than through the eyes of faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they had um, done considerable work in that direction, Eventually, some of them turned towards uh, the Islamic faith as well, and they wanted to study the Quran, its history. They wanted to study the the, 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 the Hadith uh, and its history. They wanted to study the history of uh, Muslim dogma and so on. So did they do a good job translating the work that they've done, you know, with Christian and Judaic sources and then translating that to their analysis of Hadith? Well, that has become a subject of controversy among uh, Muslims, but uh, from, from their point of view, they're part of a scholarly um, a community and that, that you know, are, are doing studies and they're publishing their studies in peer-reviewed journals um, to be tested and verified uh, and either acknowledged or repudiated by other scholars who are equally capable. And uh, they're using the methods which are, are commonly accepted among them uh, to study any uh, piece of literature or any bit of history, whether it be Muslim history and literature, Christian history or literature, Jewish history or literature, Buddhist history or literature, and so on. So from their point of view, they are trying uh, their best to uh, use uh, neutral methods um, and, and to avoid biases uh, and to uh, use the critical eye uh, to examine things and, and to get back to the origins of, of things. So let's let's start with any one of these scholars, maybe Joseph Schacht, and you can tell me what his main argument is. Yeah, so uh, Joseph Schacht and uh, prior to him, Ignaz Goldzier, um, thought that uh, the uh, basically the, the hadiths were uh, invented by uh, Muslims themselves in order to justify certain practices. Uh, they did not have... Uh, reliable information from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, because he was long dead by the time people were coming up with hadiths some generations later on uh, in a new time and, and circumstance. And so uh, they were inventing things to prove certain points. Do you think it makes sense, their argument? Well, uh, uh, Joseph Schacht did not have the last word on this because other scholars came after him and they were not so skeptical of the hadith. For okay. example, G.H.A. Uh, Yoinbol, uh, and uh, he has done a lot of studies and he took more of a middle ground um, in, in accepting that uh, we can study these hadiths and trace the origins back. And often the hadiths can be traced back to a common link. Uh, so if you have a number of chains emerging, let's say the Prophet, peace be upon him, supposedly told 
uh, one person uh, uh, something, and then that person told one person who then told one person. Well, then we have one chain uh, of narrators relating this one saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him. But let's say the Prophet, peace be upon him, told uh, two persons, who then each told two persons, who then each told two persons. So we have a branching out of uh, now uh, many chains of, of narrators. In the end, it's going to become uh, from two, it becomes four, then, then eight, then 16, then 30 to eventually you have 64 different branches of basically the same saying being narrated from one uh, person to another in a, in a chain of narrators. So uh, in this case, all of the chains go all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But what uh, Yoinbul found is that uh, in, with most hadith, the chains do not all go back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They go back to what he calls a common link. Uh, and, and in that uh, apparatus, it's as if the person, the Prophet, peace be upon him, told one person, who then told one person, who then uh, told many of his students. Mm -hmm. And then it fans out from there. So when we look at it from the other end, going back, uh, we see that the various chains do not converge to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They converge to the one person who had many students. And often that person is Al-Imam al-Zuhri, who uh, died at the beginning of the second century in the year 124. So that was still more than 100 years after the death of our Prophet, peace be upon him, still some time removed. Uh, but uh, in this way of tracing the narratives back uh, to the common links, whether it be Al-Imam al-Zuhri and sometimes even to a person prior to himself, the scholars get uh, more of an assurance that it's not all invented like a hundred couple of hundred years later, uh, but uh, they have an earlier origin. Mm -hmm. And then it didn't end there uh, because we have other scholars uh, working on this. For example, uh, some German scholars, uh, Gregor Scholl, uh, Scholler uh, and uh, uh, Andreas uh, Gorky and uh, Harold Motzke. Uh, they do very detailed analysis of the text and, and the, and the um, chains of narrators of the texts of Hadith. And uh, they come to even more um, uh, of, of a, um, a situation of confidence. They, they can arrive at, at more confident um, evaluations of the hadiths because they are able to trace some of the narratives back to even earlier uh, common links. Mm -hmm. And uh, th their, their work involves uh, not only looking at the chains of narratives, but looking at the narratives themselves and see how the narratives could have evolved from one generation to another. And with this painstaking work, again, uh, they're able to show more confidence in the hadith, much more than uh, Joseph Schacht uh, did a, a, a generation ago. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of these scholars are talking about the text and the, that there wasn't enough textual analysis being done by the scholars of the past, the Muslim scholars of the past. Yes. So uh, one of the um, ways of looking at the, at the hadith and evaluating it is by looking at the content of this, um, of the hadith itself, like the text. What does this actually say? So one person tells another person, tells another person that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said X. So is that X that we're concerned about that is called the text, this text that was being uh, transmitted from one person to another. So what does this text say? And in what social situation might it have fit? Uh, and on what function did it perform at that time? Let's say somebody invented a text. For what reason? What purpose? What did it serve at that time? What were the needs of the time that gave rise to a person inventing a text like this? So this kind of uh, careful textual analysis coupled with uh, the, uh, the isnad or the chain uh, of, of narrators uh, analyzing the isnad or the chain together with the text. This is what the scholars like Harold Motsky uh, have been doing. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Shabir, do you think that these criticisms are damaging to the sciences of hadith? Um, well, yes and no. If uh, we can say, yes, it is damaging to a traditional Muslim perception of, uh, of how the hadith should be regarded, because for hundreds of years prior to that, Muslims had become accustomed to just simply receiving the hadith as they are, taking the corpuses as they are, the major books of hadith, and treating them as though they are as sacrosanct, almost like the Quran. So whatever comes from there, we, we take it. Of course, there, there has always been a dichotomy between the scholarly 
the knowledge of these hadith books and the knowledge of the masses. The malice masses only hear the selected hadith. Mm -hmm. Let's say a scholar is going through his hadith book, he's preparing his notes to give a sermon, and he comes across a hadith which to him looks problematic. It doesn't look like everything is right about this. Uh, or he feels that this will not be well received. So what he does is that he leaves that one alone. He selects from, uh, you know, he, it's like a storehouse. He can just take what he needs. He selects what he needs to form a good sermon and he delivers that to the public. When the public hears that, all they are hearing are hadiths which have been carefully selected and that are, that are not problematic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they get the impression, the public gets the impression that hadiths are good. That's all we know. Every hadith we've ever heard is, is, is a good one. So um, it says there's no problem with hadith. Now, uh, when these uh, Orientalist scholars started working in, in the way that they worked and uh, published their results, uh, this uh, led to a great hue and cry. So this is the, you know, on the one part, we can say it is damaging to that um, uh, Muslim perception of how uh, the hadith should be perceived. But on the other hand, uh, some of this work is beneficial in that it alerted Muslims to the idea that uh, perhaps we were inadvertently circulating sayings uh, as sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, whereas they're not really his sayings. They're sayings of people from some generations after him or sometimes even sayings from early generations, uh, but uh, they're not really the saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Maybe it was the saying of a companion of the Prophet that inadvertently got retrojected back as though this was a saying of the of the prophet and you will find in fact in hadith studies today let's say the hadith scholars are dealing with a saying which is very popular among muslims or for one re reason or another um, it is thought beneficial to use that as a basis for islamic law and the best they could do is trace it back to a companion of the prophet peace be upon him now, if that saying has to do with something about, let's say, the life hereafter, um, they would say, even though it goes to the companion um, of the prophet, it, it could not have been the kind of thing that the companion would invent on his own. Mm. So he must have got it from the prophet, peace be upon him. That's the only reason he would narrate this. And so this hadith could be treated as a saying of the prophet, peace be upon him himself. And that's today. That's today scholars are doing this. Mm -hmm. So if this is the kind of working assumption that scholars are, are willing to exercise, and now you can imagine in the past as well that people sometimes may have attributed things to the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he didn't say. And, and so... So what do you think, what role do you think Muslim scholars can play in, in, in helping to fix the situation in getting rid of these fabricated hadith? Well, some Muslim scholars uh, have exercised their thought about this problem, and uh, one such uh, scholar is uh, uh, Kamal Hashimi. Um, his, his book entitled um, The Hadith Methodology has been republished in the United Kingdom. I first bought a copy in Malaysia uh, maybe a decade ago. <laughs> and uh, that book has been republished, um, first published in Malaysia, now republished uh, uh, by the Islamic Center in Markfield in the United Kingdom uh, and given a new title, Textbook of Hadith Studies. Uh, the, the, towards the end, uh, maybe the last chapter of that book uh, gives a proposal of how we move forward with hadith studies and uh, there professor hashimi uh, quotes uh, some important scholars such as uh, dr yusuf al qardawi who say that uh, now we need to go back over the corpuses of hadith the collections of hadith that we have and uh, we have to do a new study that will uh, select from those corpuses the hadith that we can present to the public as hadith that we feel confident about. So that work needs to be done. It sounds like a very daunting task. Uh, well, it, it's, it's, it's a massive task, but uh, we have the, the, the scholarly know-how uh, available out there. Um, not me, myself, I'm just a student of that great body of scholarship. Uh, but, but scholars are available who can do this if they are willing and if they are courageous enough to take on the task. And plus, nowadays we're armed with computers. You know, if we think about how our predecessors in the faith worked with pen and ink and 
you know, quill and all of that, and how they wrote such massive tomes. Now our task is easy because we have computer systems. All of the hadiths have actually been digitized. Uh, they're there available in e-form. Uh, it's easy to compare and contrast and select and, and cut and paste and, and prepare new publications uh, that will uh, give the, the Muslim populace at least uh, a set of uh, hadiths that they can feel confident about that these are not problematic, they're suitable to our time and place. This is uh, going to be a source uh, of uh, and, and a useful uh, volume to guide us in our daily lives as Muslims. We'll leave it at that. Next time when we continue our series, we will look at how ordinary Muslims can approach the hadith and apply it in their lives. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. Look, Safiya, my inbox is full. I have questions from our viewers. Wow, that's yeah. quite a bit. Your questions are coming out of my ears. That's why we've got something really exciting planned for you, a YouTube Live Q&A. You can join us live and Dr. Shabir will answer your questions as they come in. This event will kick off our special Ramadan programming as well as our fundraising campaign. It's all happening on Sunday, April 4th at 12 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel, Quran Speaks. And that's right before Ramadan. I can't wait to see what questions we'll get. Me too. It'll be fun to chat with you in real time. Subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you don't miss this event.